Aloha, good morning, everybody. Um, I am pleased to be here, and I want to share with you something that I've just been given. It's a quarter, um, and it's a special quarter because it is the first currency, or US currency anyway, probably any currency, um, with a native Hawaiian woman on it. Yeah, and um, I'll let you guys look at it for 25 cents each. Um, so the woman is Auntie Edith, otherwise known as Kumu Edith uh, Kanaka Ole, who spearheaded a cultural revitalization in the 70s. So. And the person who gave it to me is our next speaker. So I'm excited to introduce her. It, her name is Erica Mortsugu, and she's going to speak about the administration's commitment to advancing gender equity. Ms. Moritsugu is the Deputy Assistant to the President and Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Senior Liaison. She has diverse and deep experience on Capitol Hill and within governmental agencies fighting for social justice and the empowerment of communities and individuals. She was the Vice President at National Partnership for Women and Families and prior to that served as the Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Relations at the Department of Housing and Urban Development under the leadership of Secretary Julian Castro in the Obama administration. Prior to her work at, sorry, lost my place here, prior to her work at the National Partnership, Erica led the government relations, advocacy, and communi community engagement team at the Anti-Defamation League. She has also served as general counsel for Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, for whom she provided legislative and political strategic counsel and managed the senator's AAPI outreach and judiciary, civil rights, and economic policies. Um, and she and actually the speaker after her and I are all Oahu natives and friends, and that is why I have the pleasure of welcoming Ms. Erica Mortsugu. Lila, you're taller than me. Um, aloha, y'all. Aloha. aloha. Mahalo nui, Lila, for that warm introduction. And thank you to the Women's Funding Network for inviting me to join this room full of inspiring leaders. I'm honored to be here on behalf of the White House um, as the President's Deputy Assistant and a Senior Liaison to the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities to uplift and honor you amazing trailblazers and, and boss ladies who are making a difference across every sector in our society every day. Now, as a woman of color who is often the only Asian American or woman of color or woman at all in my college classes or at law school or in meetings throughout my career, starting as a GS1 clerk typist, I had to take a typing test to take that test uh, to get that job. Um, and it was a long time ago. It was like 110 years ago. But um, I'm, I'm proud to say that I serve in the most diverse administration in our history and one that has worked to advance gender equity and equality since day one. Today, we have an all-time record number of women serving in President Biden's cabinet, nine of whom are women of color. We have Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, the first woman, first black, and first South Asian, holding the second highest office in the land. And I will never get tired of showing off about that. This administration has uplifted women and women of color, breaking glass ceilings by nominating and appointing them into historic roles, including Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. And in the president's cabinet, we have Secretary Janet Yellen, the first woman to serve as Secretary of Treasury. <laughs> Secretary Deb Holland, the first Native American to ever serve as a cabinet secretary, as the Secretary of Interior, Ambassador Catherine Tai, the first Asian American to serve as our US Trade Representative, Acting Secretary Julie Su, who the President has nominated to serve as his next Secretary of Labor, Assistant to the President, Dr. Arthi Prabhakar, the first South Asian American to lead the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, and innumerable innumerable other senior staff and first evers throughout the agencies, including Neera Tanzan, Assistant to the President and Domestic Policy Advisor, the first AA or NHPI to lead any of the three major White House Policy Councils in history. 
You heard from Jen Klein yesterday, um, who also serves as our first ever director of the Gender Pol Equity Policy Council, and um, Nani Claretti, and more on her later. But it's really empowering to have a president and a vice president who've elevated such amazing, highly qualified and inspiring women to lead um, in these roles. And so future generations of women and girls can see themselves in all of our possibilities. You know what else? Nearly 60% of presidential appointees throughout the administration are women. And about half of them identify as non-white. The administration understands that it's vital that women of all races, sexual orientation, sexual identity, and abilities are represented at tables where decisions are made, hold leadership positions, and are a part of the policymaking process. Because when our voices are heard, our policies are better. And it, it was from the very beginning when President Biden and Vice President Harris have prioritized not just gender inclusion, but gender equity. And I've seen this commitment shown by the President and the Vice President and my fellow colleagues at the White House toward advancing rights and opportunities for women and girls at home and around the world. It's why the President created the historic White House Gender Policy Council to advance gender equity and equality in domestic and foreign policy and directed the council to develop the first ever national strategy to guide our work on gender equity and equality as a government and as a nation. You heard from the extraordinary Jen Klein yesterday. Um, she couldn't be here today. She had to fly in and out for another thing on the West Coast, best coast. But it's from, <laughs> yes. Oh, and so you'll, this, this is, you'll see this in the biography too. Not only are Nani and I, grew, grew, we grew up um, one valley away from each other in Hawaii, but we also have, um, Bay Area roots together too, so so I get to be loud and proud about that um, as just like an added bonus sweetener. Um, but it is, it's from health and education to climate change and economic security to gender-based violence, humanitarian efforts. We're committed to tackling issues that matter to women at home and abroad. But you all know that we can't get to where we want by ourselves. None of this work happens without community, without you amazing women and our allies. I'm so grateful to be here in community with all of you, again, who are working to change the face of the corporate government, nonprofit, media, and creative worlds, to celebrate our progress and recommit to um, the work ahead. Looking at this gorgeous room, I have so much pride in how far we've come and so much hope for our future and the hard work that we still have to do together. As the president has said, quote, let us strive to create a nation where every woman and girl knows her possibilities know no bounds in America. So here's the part where I quote somebody quoting somebody else, but this happens to be the vice president quoting her mother. She told her that you may be the first, but you will not be the last. And that's how we create a better, um, more sustainable future. And we solidify the gains that we've made to increase diversity and build future leaders and sustain current leaders. We lift up others as we rise. It's what we would say in Hawaii is our kuleana. It's both our honor, but also our burden as our responsibility that we undertake. So please continue to charge ahead. As long as you don't forget to look behind and let us lift others up because we all need each other. And because that's what leadership is about. That's what woman leadership is all about, uniting and empowering others building intersectional, interracial, and interreligious coalitions so that we can address the most pressing issues that we're all facing together. Obviously, you are all in this room because you care about our community of sisterhood and are already leaders. So thank you for your leadership and for being here and for inviting me to share this space with you. It's now my honor to introduce you all to a dear friend and a fearless leader for our community. Um, she took the advice from Kamala Harris's mom um, by not just being the first ever, but breaking her own record as the highest um, ranking Filipino American in, in an administration. Um, she was my boss in the Obama administration when she was confirmed by the Senate to serve as Deputy Secretary at Housing and Urban Development. And then returns in the Biden-Harris administration to be Senate confirmed to serve as the highest ranking Filipino American of any gender to serve as the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, so it's my honor and great pleasure to introduce Nani Kularevi. Thank you all, mahalo.
Aloha. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm up here today and I got to follow two friends and two other fellow Hawaiian uh, residents of Hawaii that I grew up with. So that is just amazing to me. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hawaii today because um, people thought it might be a good idea to do that. Um, but first I wanna do some thank yous. Thank you to the Women's Funding Network for inviting me here to this incredible event. Uh, it's remarkable to be surrounded by so many passionate trailblazing women. Uh, it's just, I can feel the energy here, so it's really great. Um, and it's also an honor to be here on behalf of the Biden administration from the Office of Management and Budget. And as Erica said, my name is Nani Coloretti, and I'm the deputy director, and I'm serving under the first woman of color to run the Office of Management and Budget, Shalanda Young. <laughs> you want to talk about how um, when you give, when women become leaders, they get things done and they and they make things happen. That is Shalanda. Um, in spades, and so um, I'm just so lucky to work with her and the Biden administration is lucky to have her. So just a word about OMB, since you may not know what we do. <laughs> it's some budgety thing and it's unclear. Um, <laughs> well, we serve the, the President of the United States in implementing his vision across the executive branch and we're the largest component of the White House uh, executive offices of the President. We report directly to President Biden and we work every day to put the president's commitment to equity for all into action, uh, both through our formulation of the budget and how we execute it, our regulatory agenda, and also how we manage all of the departments. So when people say, we're taking a whole of government approach to X, something that we're trying to do, oftentimes that's OMB that's making sure that that happens. Um, and so that's, it's, it's really fun. President Biden has called OMB the nerve center of government, and Erica Moritsugu has called it the nerd center of government, which I <laughs> proudly wear, <laughs> um, because um, there's someone there that works on every single uh, part of the federal government. It's about 550 people. Um, and so that leaves us uniquely suited to sort of build equity into the general business of government and make sure it works better for all of us, including women and women of color. So we're pushing on every open door, regulatory, budgetary, and legislative to continue to increase opportunity and equity across government. So just one word on the power of women. So as Leela knows, I grew up in a family of women. I have four sisters. My mom was the main wage earner in my family and my grandmother the matriarch of our Filipino family lived with us. Uh, we did not grow up with a lot of money, but I did grow up with a lot of amazing examples of women taking charge of things and making a difference. For example, my mom was a small business owner. She was a childcare provider, and my grandmother was one of the first Filipina nurses in the country. So seeing these women navigate and be fearless and provide great examples for me to emulate over the decades has helped me in my public service. Uh, where, like Erica, I've often been the only woman in the room. As Erica described, the Biden administration's appointment of women into senior roles is historic. The fact that 60% of appointees across the administration are women, and that half of those women are women of color, is also historic. Representation matters. It shows up in the unique experiences we bring to the table, and as a result, the policies we create and implement and I'm fortunate to be at the table as part of this administration. For me, there's no greater example of how important it is to have those unique perspectives at the table than this administration's response to the fires on Maui. Um, so, as I mentioned before, like Erica and Leela, I was raised in Hawaii, and I still remain very connected to the aina there, the land, even though I no longer live there. So being at the table during important conversations about the recovery efforts on Maui has allowed me to bring my perspective and the unique perspectives of Hawaii residents to the forefront. And also having a partner like Erica in her role and other na amazing Native Hawaiian women serving in the Biden administration has been instrumental in to make sure that we're addressing Native Hawaiian and Hawaii resident needs in a culturally competent way. So I wanna talk just a tiny bit about the fires in Maui and the federal response both to tell you what we're doing there and also just to serve as a broader example of how the federal government can be brought together to solve tough challenges and do hard things. So just to give a little background about Lahaina, this is the largest fire in the US in over 100 years, the largest, the largest number of deaths 
in a fire in over 100 years. The count right now stands at 115 lives lost. Um, but there's also the loss of important sacred history. Lahaina was the first capital of the United Hawaiian Islands uh, by when after the islands were united by King Kamehameha in 1810. And many Hawaiian kings, queens, and high chiefs and princesses are, are buried in Lahaina. It was also a historic whaling town and had just a number of historic landmarks um, to mark Lahaina, Maui, and Hawaii's history. So you can imagine, after all of this was burned to the ground, just the trauma being experienced there by those directly and indirectly affected. So where are we right now, the federal government? So the president declared a major disaster a couple of days after the fires and has now mobilized a whole of government effort to the disaster with more than 1,000 federal personnel on the ground in Maui to help every aspect of the response and the recovery effort. And I'll just give a few examples. So FEMA's search and rescue team, the Department of Defense, Health and Human Services, and the Honolulu FBI were among the federal partners helping search the area after the fire and identify victims. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has 180 people on the ground in Maui, and they're focused on monitoring air and water quality in order to protect residents from the environmental hazards and health hazards from the fire. And they're assisting the state and the Army Corps of Engineers with debris removal, which is really the first thing that needs to happen, and it needs to happen in a culturally competent way. For NFEMA, the president appointed uh, the FEMA Region 9 Administrator as the Chief Federal Response Coordinator for Maui, so he is on site there, and he's coordinating the federal's long-term, short-term and long-term recovery efforts on the ground. And he actually reports back to the highest levels of government. So he reports back to um, a deputies group that I go to, and he reports back to the cabinet. The Red Cross and Maui County have housed 2,500 people in hotels, and they've provided three meals a day to about 6,000 people. Uh, and then they also, FEMA also operates three county disaster recovery centers um, in Maui for survivors to speak to specialists, connect with community organizations, and get help in applying for federal assistance. And FEMA and the Small Business Administration have approved more than 58, almost $59 million so far in federal assistance to survivors of the Maui fires, which includes almost $21 million in FEMA assistance for individuals and households, and just over $38 million in small business disaster loans so far for affected Maui homeowners, renters, and businesses. And just a word on small businesses in Hawaii. Um, they're very important to help Hawaii recover and thrive. They represent 99% of all businesses in the state, over 99%, and they employ over half of the local workforce, 268,000 people. So it's very important to actually get in there early um, to try to do that, even as you're still, you know, clearing debris, and SBA has over 30 staff on the ground there to help business owners navigate their programs. Um, so because of this unique, what I've been mentioning as the unique needs in Hawaii, all of this work is happening. Um, actually, all of the work FEMA does takes the lead from the people on the ground, the state and the local governments on the ground. But in Hawaii, um, we've at, the federal government has actually reached out through SBA and FEMA to contract with local vendors to provide culturally competent training um, as they are doing their response and to also um, provide materials in multiple languages to make sure that there's language access. And EPA's response, um, they went a step further and they have partnered with Maui County leaders and the Hawaii State Historic Preservation Division um, to make sure that as they're going through all of the burned areas, they're doing the right thing on the ground and they're making their resources available to all the federal government, all of our partners basically on the ground. So this is just a small example of how the federal government's resources can be organized quickly to respond to a critical event and I can say from my career at many federal agencies over the years that one of the things I learned is that the federal government response effort continuously improves. So um, we learn after um, disasters like Katrina or Hurricane Sandy and actually adapt, adapt our programs, adapt our approaches. So that's the good news about that. 
Um, this president is committed not just to doing the work of disaster response, but longer term recovery uh, and advance this work in an inclusive and culturally competent way is taking the lead from the people in Hawaii. So we're committed to doing this work, not just in Hawaii, but across all of our programs to advance equity at, for all, which I could talk about a whole nother time, but we're doing a lot in that space. Um, and our work in Maui is really just an opportunity to demonstrate this. So just to kind of close out, um, first of all, I took a look at your conference materials, the kinds of things you've been doing even in the pre-conference and now, and it's very inspiring. It's inspiring to see you here. It's inspiring to see your work and your dedication. And I want to say your partners in the work that we do. You hold us accountable, <laughs> and you help make our work better, and you help us adapt. So keep going. And I'll just close with something that um, we're about to celebrate, um, all of us, or all of you who celebrate, the Jewish New Year this weekend, Rosh Hashanah. Um, and I am going to quote a quote, as Erica did, which I heard from Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday at an event. She was quoting the Talmud. And she said, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And I thought that was pretty inspiring, both for me and hopefully for you and what you're doing. So thank you for your time, and thanks for being here today.